Good morning, everyone, and a happy 2021 filled with God's hope to you and your family. It's so wonderful to be here together with you again. Well, continuing with the series on answered prayers, I have the privilege to talk from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. My talk is about the tale of two Hannahs and the prayer that changed everything. You might be wondering why I chose to title my talk, A Tale of Two Hannahs. I know that the narrative here in 1 Samuel chapter 1 wasn't a tale at all. It was a real solid family drama. Neither were there two Hannahs, there was only one. But looking closely at this woman's story, we can see two completely different types of behavior. So I have called her the two Hannahs. The first one is the troubled Hannah, and the second is joyful Hannah. Let's look at this phenomenal transformation in Hannah's life. And I pray that you will be blessed and that out of this very familiar, well-known story, God will bring a new refreshing blessing over your life. Amen. Let's look at the life of the troubled Hannah. In verse 15, Hannah described herself as a woman who is deeply troubled. She wasn't only troubled, she was deeply troubled. But did Hannah really have reasons to be deeply troubled? Or was she being just oversensitive? Hannah lived in what was a very hostile period where the judges had been ruling Israel for almost 300 years. It was a period of cultural and historical hostility towards women, and in particular to those women who couldn't conceive an heir for their husbands. In verse one and two, we see that it was culturally acceptable for a man to have more than one wife. And that was the source of Hannah's trouble. Hannah was married to Elkanah, but verse five says that she couldn't have children. So Hannah was probably the source of gossip and humiliation, being stigmatized as a woman cursed by God. So her husband took a second wife, probably to give him a chance to have children to continue his lineage. And this other woman, Penina, was very fertile. Verse four informs us that every year when Elkanah went from Ephraim to Shiloh to sacrifice and worship God, he took both his wives and children and he gave the meat to them and to all Penina's sons and daughters. This indicates that Penina had a minimum four children, while Hannah had none. But Hannah had the love of her husband, which everybody could see, including Penina. And because Elpana loved Hannah, he would give her the double portion of meat. Well, humanly speaking, Hannah didn't deserve that double portion of affection. After all, she hadn't given children to her husband, but that was grace. It's like God's grace when he blesses us, even when we don't deserve it. Praise God for his amazing grace. In verse 6 and 7, the Bible tells us that Penina was Hannah's rival. Can you imagine that? And she had almost pleasure in provoking Hannah 
in order to irritate her. Hannah's home environment was one of oppression, despair, anguish, humiliation, and hatred, all inflicted by her husband's other wife. Year after year, Hannah's despair and humiliation caused by Penina was so great that she had no desire to eat and she would cry publicly. Everybody saw her unhappiness, including her husband. But in that particular year, something changed. In verse eight, we see that her husband saw her affliction. He noticed the anguish of her soul. So he asked her this question. Don't I mean to you more than 10 sons? Of course he didn't. Otherwise, she wouldn't be crying, would she? In fact, I believe that what he was trying to say was more or less like this. Hannah, I see your pain. I see your despair. I see your troubled soul. How I wish I could make you as happy as ten sons would. Then, maybe with his words echoing her soul, Hannah realized that her husband couldn't help her. In fact, no one could. Only God could and would be able to help her. Her husband's words, I believe, were like fuel to her soul, empowering her to push through all the enemies of her soul. Then she went to the temple and she prayed. Verse 10 says that in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. She was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Because of that, she was wrongly judged and was confronted by Eli, the high priest, as he thought she was drunk in the temple. But regardless, Hannah poured out her soul to God. Hannah poured out her heart, her affliction to God. She had no hidden agenda in her prayer. She had no words to describe to God about the pain in her soul. The only thing she could offer God was her tears and her anguish. Verse 11, even overwhelmed with anxieties and affliction, Hannah managed to give God her petition. She prayed a very simple prayer to God. She asked God to remember her and to give her a son. And she made a vow to give that son back to God for him to serve God all the days of his life. Maybe you feel like Hannah, overwhelmed by worries, fear, anxieties. Maybe you have cried out to God in need of a miracle. Maybe you don't even know how to pray for whatever your need is. Maybe you feel exhausted physically, emotionally, spiritually, with all that's going on around you right now. God hears our prayers. God knows you. He knows your heart. Trust him and continue bringing your needs and your petitions to the one who loves you, to the one who created you, to the only one who knows no defeat, to the only one who can do the impossible for you today. Amen. The second Hannah is a joyful Hannah. Hannah was accused wrongly by Eli, the high priest, of being drunk, but she didn't take offense at his words and misjudgment of her. Instead, we see in verse 17 and 18 that once Eli spoke a word of blessing over her life, 
She grabbed the word with all her being. She believed that that word came from the Lord. And she trusted in that word of blessing, even before she saw the answer of her prayer. And from that prayer, two things happened to Hannah. She was healed emotionally right there as she received the word from the Lord. Her face changed. She wasn't in tears any longer. She ate her food. Her eyes were filled with light again. Her soul was saturated with hope once more. She was like enveloped with absolute trust that God was taking care of her and her petition. Also, her body was healed. Verses 20 and 19 and 20 says, Next morning, they went back home to Ramah. And the Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Hallelujah. Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named her son Samuel, which means God hears. Beautiful. In Shiloh, Hannah believed. In Rama, the miracle happened. Her body was healed. Her womb was healed. Her prayer was answered because God heard her. And as you well know, at the due time, Hannah fulfilled her vow to God. After Samuel had been weaned, she took him to the temple to serve God all the days of his life. Samuel became the last judge and the first prophet of the nation of Israel. He was the one who brought back the presence of God and the voice of God to the nation of Israel at that time. Hannah wanted a son. God wanted a prophet. What a beautiful partnership in prayer that was. Amen. I became a follower of Jesus in 1992. And it wasn't well received by my family, especially my mother. She thought that I had rejected all the teaching about God she gave me. She saw my new life in Jesus as a betrayal of the Catholic traditions I had been taught by my parents. And she made my life very difficult, very unpleasant. I know what is to be ridiculed, to be laughed at, and to be the source of gossip within my own family. But I never stopped praying for my mother. I spent 30 years praying for my mother's salvation and talking to her about Jesus' love for her on the cross. I always ask God to allow me to know for sure about my mom's eternal salvation. That was the desire of my heart. In January, three years ago, my mom was gravely ill and taken to hospital where she stayed for a week in intensive care. I flew immediately to Brazil and continued to pray with her in her hospital bed, even though she was in a coma. I wondered if I would ever get one last chance to pray with my mother for her salvation. Then, miraculously, she came out of her coma and just two days before she died, I prayed with her and she accepted Jesus as her savior and Lord. Amen, hallelujah. The night she passed away, I was alone with her in the intensive care unit. And I was able to hold her in my arms, pray for her as she breathed her last breath. She died in my arms. I was able to pass her from my arms into the arms of our faithful Heavenly Father. That was a beautiful privilege I had. Amen. 
God heard my prayer, just as he heard Hannah's prayer. Hannah found the fountain of her joy in God himself, and not only in her son. She was determined that that son wasn't going to be an idol in her heart. Amen. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, Hannah's beautiful prayer shows she understood that even though blessings from the Lord are good, are legitimate, are to be thought after and desired, they can't take God's place in our hearts. The most important thing for, of all in prayer is to give ourselves completely to God. Our hearts, our fears, our anxieties, our hurts, our needs, our dreams, our plans, and so on. And as we give ourselves completely in prayer, God gives himself completely to us. Amen. That's our God. Anna asked God for one son. But in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 5, tells us that God gave her seven children. God is much more generous than what we can ever think or imagine. Amen. God can give you much more than what you have asked him for. God can do for you much more than what you have asked him for. And if you haven't seen the answers of your prayers, I want to encourage you, don't give up. Pray and trust in God. He is in control. He hears your prayer. His time is always perfect. But above all, offer yourself to God completely in prayer. And if you don't know, this faithful God who revealed himself in Jesus, I encourage you to invite him into your heart right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you came revealing God to us, revealing the Father. Lord, I pray that you come into my heart and be my Savior, be my Lord right now. I accept you, Lord, as the guide, a guide in my life. I accept you as the only one who can give me salvation, eternal life, forgive my sins and uh, bring me to the light. Bring me into the kingdom of light, your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.